Welcome back to the podcast. And on today's show, we have Professor of Political Science, Economics and Public Policy at Duke University, the author of The Share Economy, Choosing in Groups, Is Capitalism Sustainable, and many other books, which I will link below the podcast. This is Michael Munger. Michael, welcome to the podcast. It's a pleasure to be on, Jed. Thank you. So we're going to talk about uh, James Buchanan, Gordon Tulloch, and the book they wrote together, The Calculus of Consent. And I'm going to do a bad job um, in- introducing these people and this book. So I might send it straight to you as the first question. Why, who, who were these people? And what is this book? And why was it so influential at the time? James Buchanan uh, was a, as a fellow redneck, I will say, a redneck from Tennessee. One of the reasons I got along with him is that we were both raised in families where our fathers did not finish high school and we both lived on farms. Um, He, though, came from what had been a wealthy family. Uh, He was expected to go to law school, but because of the Depression, he had to work his way through school. He went to Middle Tennessee State University uh, right in his hometown so that he could milk cows in the morning before class. Um, He then went into the Navy and served in the intelligence services. And I think that expanded his world quite a bit. He lived in uh, Hawaii, spent some time in Japan, came back and then went to the University of Chicago. He described himself as a libertarian socialist. And that sounds like a contradiction in terms, but in Weimar, Germany, there actually was a libertarian socialist party. It didn't do very well, as as you might expect, because the the, the discussions at the party meetings must have been complicated. But you, you can see the two competing ideas in Buchanan's mind, even at that point. He was skeptical about concentrations of power, and he thought growing up as he did in the defeated old Confederate South and seeing large concentrations of the Wall Street barons, he thought, controlling the economy, uh, having caused the depression, uh, taking everyone's money. Uh, he, he wanted some way of controlling concentrations of power, but he, he was very skeptical about actual activities of the state. Well, at the University of Chicago, he met a number of people. The most influential was Frank Knight, uh, who was one of his professors. And Knight fairly quickly persuaded him that while it was true that it might be that large concentrations of power were dangerous, even in a capitalist economy, that's not the way that markets actually worked. And if the government had not spent so much time kind of assisting the concentration of power during the Roosevelt administration and during the war, and it's actually true, the United States government and the British government uh, had really concentrated industry so as to make it easier to regulate, Uh, Buchanan felt as if his mind was changed about the way that an open access order with emergent anarcho-capitalist institutions might work. So he came, there was a central question, and the reason for this long story, I'm sorry for its length, but the reason for this long story is that it came down to a central question. And that question is, when is it legitimate for one person to coerce another person using force without the other person's consent. And so it might be an individual or it might be something that we call the state, but we would have to define the state. Now, philosophers call this the problem of political authority. Problem of political authority, it sounds different, but it's actually the same question. When am I morally obliged to obey the commands of the state? Now, I can be forced to comply because the state has guns and attack helicopters and tanks. That's not the question. The question is, when am I morally obliged? When do I have an obligation to obey the commands of the state? And so that was what uh, Buchanan was interested in. He met a younger man who had gone to law school and had served in uh, the Foreign Service in China during the Second World War named Gordon Tulloch, they met at the University of Virginia that had established a center for the study of political economy and philosophy, and they began to write this book. 
And you can tell from the title what their answer is to the question, when is it okay for one person to coerce another? The title of the book is The Calculus of Consent. The answer is, if you have consented to be coerced. So that, that, that's as fast as I could make the introduction. The question is, when is it okay for one person to coerce another? And the answer is, when the person being coerced has consented to it. That's a wonderful introduction because it, it pushed past a lot of the in questions I was going to get out of the way. So let's jump into that question. That's the, the fascinating part of this. So many people actually have this feeling out there. They hear this phrase that the government is the rule of the people. And yet all the time people have this feeling that it's the rule of some people over some other people. So uh, how does a democratic system work in that sense? Because the idea of it being morally okay for someone to coerce you to agree with something, in most cases, it feels like we don't um, consent. We don't agree to this coercion. It always feels like we are being coerced without any prior consent. There was a famous French philosopher, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who in his uh, famous book, his masterwork, Du Contrat Social, The Social Contract, asked the most important question in political philosophy. And that question is, how can it be that a man is both free and yet forced to obey wills not his own? How can a man be both, be both free and yet forced to, to obey wills not his own? Because that's what happens you use the word democracy. There's a lot of meanings to democracy. Let's let's not define democracy for now. Let's just call mm -hmm. it majority rule. Okay. So in a majority rule, it means that it might be that 51% of the people want to enslave 49% of the people. If you believe in pure majoritarianism, then it must be okay for 51%, because it's the majority, to be able to impose its will on the other. Now, Rousseau's answer uh, was, and you should hear bolts slamming in carbines and uh, boots marching on pavement when he says this, the answer is that I, if I'm in the minority, I am mistaken about what Rousseau calls the general will. There's an underlying thing that is the best for the society to do, and we discover that by having a vote. If I disagree with that, then I am mistaken. If I persist in my mistaken dissent, one of two fates awaits me, either jail or an insane asylum, because Rousseauian democracies only have one party. And of course, they would only have one party because anyone who disagrees with the majority is either insane or evil. So Buchanan and Tulloch disagree with that view of majoritarianism. They want to define something that they call democracy. Their definition of democracy combines two things. First, a constitution that limits the domain, the set of questions that majorities get to decide. And second, the procedures within that domain, how majoritarian rules will be applied. And so that's what's important is we're going to use majority. We're going to unanimously agree to choose things by majority. That's complicated. Let me say it again. We're all going to agree. We're going to sign a constitution. Constitutions are rules about rules. What we're going to do is decide that we're going to decide a certain set of questions, like what is the speed limit going to be? Um, how much are we going to spend on defense? How much are we going to spend on education? We're going to decide those things by majority rule. And if the outcome that I don't want happens, I still consented to use majority rule, even though I didn't consent to the particular outcome. So the thesis that goes through the calculus of consent is what you're consenting to is the rules, not to the outcomes. However, the rules have to be enforced to make sure that majorities don't get to decide things like the majority is going to enslave the minority, or the majority is going to say, we're going to prevent people we disagree with from having an outlet being able to write in the press or be able to express themselves on Twitter. We're going to use censorship. All of those things in the constitution are going to be ruled out. So the consent is given to the set of rules, not to the outcomes. 
Now that sounds, um, and for many listeners, that might sound like in a very high bar that the idea of unanimous consent, uh, getting 51% of the vote is um, not straightforward, but it, you know, it's achievable. Getting 100% of a vote on something, especially in today's world, though at least that's the way it seems, might be an incredibly high bar. So if you raise it to that point of unanimous, unanimous consent, how could we ever discover any sort of reasonable rule about a rule that we could agree upon? So Buchanan and Tulloch started to explore that because that is the immediate objection that, okay, let's suppose that in principle, unanimous consent might justify coercion. So I have agreed to these rules. And then when I disagree with the outcome, I try to say, no, forget it, but I'm punished. Well, wait, you consented. That requires actual consent, not hypothetical consent, not mythical consent. So the, the social contract that Rousseau was talking about was mythical. It never actually happened. Uh, Thomas Hobbes, when he talks about the contract to, to justify the sovereign to get out of the state of nature, he says at one point, now I admit nothing like this ever actually happened, but it's sort of a thought experiment, a Gedanken experiment. Well, <laughs> That's not how this works. It has to be actual consent. And so Buchanan and Tulloch started to build up. And we actually are used to enforceable contracts that do have unanimous consent. It happens to us all the time. And they're just bilateral contracts. Suppose that I am a roofer. I put roofs on houses. You have a house that needs a new roof. It requires unanimous consent between the two of us. Both of us have to agree on a price. Now, you say, I will pay you uh, $1,000 to buy shingles and $4,000 for the labor if you put a new roof on my house. If I take the $1,000 that you give me and run off with it, the police come and arrest me. They say, no, you signed the contract. You agree. So we can get unanimous consent in all sorts of bilateral voluntary exchanges. The question is, can we scale up from those voluntary exchanges? And here's the important thing, Jed. Mm -hmm. If I could not sign that contract and have it be binding, that would be a really important limitation on my liberty. To have liberty, I have to be able to sign enforceable contracts. So we were going to have some kind of third party that's going to specialize in contract enforcement. There's nothing to say that it's the government. It might be private enforcement. It might be an agency or someone who specializes in concentrated violence who, who uses a reputation for fair enforcement. These different agencies could compete with each other. And if I take the money that you give me to buy the shingles and I try to run away, this the enforcement body punishes me. Or if I, do, I buy the shingles, I do the work, and you refuse to pay the 4000 you promised, you would get punished. And notice that both of us are better off if that system relies seamlessly and reliably. So we want to be able to be assured that each of us, if we violate the terms of this unanimous agreement, will be punished. The question is, does that scale up? Does it work for anything other than bilateral voluntary exchanges? So that, so, was, that was my very next question, actually. Yeah. So uh, in the book, there's this big illusion between economics and politics there. And I assume many people listening will say that works really well when you're when I want to buy a roof, I want to buy the shingles um, in a marketplace. I tend to get what I want. And when I don't get what I want, I feel the absolute 100 percent loss of the thing I paid for. But when I vote for a president, I don't really have any expectation that that president's going to be elected. There's nothing there. And if I don't vote, it doesn't really have an impact on the outcome of the election itself. And there's all sorts of things such as in an election, because I feel like I have less impact and I know I have less impact on the outcome, I, I tend to do things like vote my conscience, for example, in ways where I otherwise wouldn't in the rest of um, an economic environment. The difficulty mm. is that in order for this kind of system to scale up, we would need to be able to have people have a particular kind of alternative. So in the case of you and I negotiate about a roof, there are other people that put roofs on houses. There's other houses for you to put roofs on. So we're operating in an environment where each of us has alternatives. 
Once we sign the contract, though, we're bound. And so the question is, can we make that analogy work? And so exactly the question that you just asked led James Buchanan to come up with the justification for organizations that he called clubs. And clubs, this, this is a brilliant insight. It's actually a big part of the reason he got the Nobel Prize in economics, which he won in 1986. Clubs are organizations where groups of people can sign a binding contract. So suppose that, because if, if I pay you to build me a golf course, and then I get a golf course, a golf course is a lot for one person. It would actually be a lot easier for, say, 300 of us to band together and then hire someone to build a golf course for us. And we'll call this our country club. And at the country club, all of us have certain rights and we'll have a meeting to decide uh, what the rules are going to be. And then everyone signs off on it. And if you sign, you actually have to pay money. But notice that you can exit. You can quit that club. You don't have to move. You don't have to give up your business. You don't have to renounce your citizenship. You can exit that club. So the essence of being able to participate in a, a scaled up system called a club is the availability of exit. But if I don't exit, if I continue to be part of the club and I continue to play golf at that club, I am obliged to continue to pay my dues to that club. Now, those look like taxes, mm. but it's actually a voluntary payment. So the, the, the dues that I pay every year is one of the 300 members. So a club is something in between the bilateral contract between the roofer and the homeowner and the political system. But at this point, Buchanan said, you know, I'm actually not sure we can use this system to justify the state because it, it may not actually work. The essence of public choice, if you were to have just a, a, a brief phrase, to because the calculus of consent started a field of political science and economics called public choice. Buchanan summarized it as politics as exchange. We are, will all be better off if we participate in these group bargains, not just bilateral private agreements, but in large scale agreements, maybe an entire city, not just a golf club, but an entire city. If all of us can agree to provide fire protection, police protection, that still doesn't mean it's provided by the government, but it's gonna be provided collectively. And if we don't pay our dues, will be kicked out of the club. The difference is, if I get kicked out of the club called a city, I have to move. An exit is a much less viable option. So the, the, the extent to which these clubs elide over as, the, as they provide more and more different services, and it looks more like a government, it makes it more difficult to get the unanimous consent that is required, which means that James Buchanan was a really big fan of what Americans call federalism. The fact that there's 50 different American states and you can move at pretty low cost among the states limits the ability of any state to impose tyrannical regulations or taxes because we have the right of exit. But that right of exit is not quite the same as it is just quitting a golf club. I, it's expensive. I have to move. But it, the... The, the second order level of consent is maybe you didn't agree to the contract, but if you stay within the political geographic area that defines the constitution, that means you consent because you other, if you can exit, but you don't exit, you consent to be part of it. It's also expensive to leave the golf club in a way if you still want to play yeah. golf. So this yep. is my question about the line between um, the collective and the individual in this, because my reading of Gordon Tullock and um, Buchanan is that they, they, I'm not sure, they, at times they seem to draw a line, and most times they seem to not draw a line between the two, that there's no psychological difference between the group and the individual. Please correct me if I'm wrong about that. But there's... Um, uh, if you really want to play golf and you exit the golf club, you have to build your own golf course. And or if you know if if you want uh, you you pull it, your streets to be policed, you can do it yourself, and everyone can do it themselves. Or they collectively come together and choose in that way. So um, in some ways, it does sound it does feel like being part of a of a social club, and that the real choice of for, for the things that we don't want to do, the things we want to give away to the to the collective. Are they all, are they mostly e economic decisions? 
I think that Buchanan made a mistake calling it politics as exchange. I think he should have called it politics as cooperation, because that exchange metaphor I don't think really works uh, for just the reason that you say. It, it's not that we're actually exchanging goods and services. What, we, what we're doing is coming up with an agreement to cooperate. Nonetheless, we're better off cooperating than not cooperating. Yes, the, there, there are costs, and I may be... Uh, have, if I the threat to leave, if I actually have to carry out the threat to leave, that's really expensive. In fact, David Hume famously said about this idea of implied consent, it's like saying I was taken aboard a ship while I was asleep. And then we're 100 leagues out at sea and I wake up and say, well, I don't want to be here. I don't want to obey these rules. And the captain says, well, you don't have to obey the rules. You can jump overboard and be consumed by the giant monsters of the sea. Well, that's not a very good choice. That's not consent. And that's the implied consent that we see at the level of most nations. So what Buchanan and Tulloch were trying to do was explain the reasoning of James Madison and the other the framers of the U.S. Constitution who used federalism to do the best that they could to provide some sort of exit option. And having some exit option is better than none at all. And there really are advantages. There are goods that have enormous economies of scale to such an extent that economists call them public goods. And markets are unlikely to be able to provide those things very well, because if they're provided at all, I can't charge a price for them because they'll be available to everyone. Now, most of the things that governments do are not public goods, though. And in fact, most of them are done without my actual consent. I might vote against them, but have to pay for them anyway. So the way that this is usually described on the left is, well, we have to overcome the free rider problem. You're going to enjoy these public goods and not pay for them. Buchanan and Tulloch were worried about the forced writer problem. I don't want this good and I have to pay for it anyway. And so that's the, the problem is, how are we going to balance the free rider and the forced rider uh, problems? And it, the, the best that we can probably do is to preserve the option of exit as best we can, because the benefits of having some kind of central organization to provide defense at least is very large. Now, as Buchanan got older, he became more skeptical of this early optimism. That book was written in 1962, and Buchanan pretty quickly decided he had been too optimistic for just the reasons that you say, that this doesn't, this isn't about states. This might be about golf clubs. Well, in that case, he needed to rethink this, and he wrote a book called The Limits of Liberty, which he published in 1975, where his claim was that it might just be that we have to make some bad choices, particularly in a world where other nations are autocratic and have powerful militaries. We can't rely on other countries to forbear if we are militarily weak. But that's a terrible solution because having a strong military is likely to mean that we the citizens themselves are going to be coerced by precisely the military power that they had created to ensure their own protection. So there are limits to what we can actually accomplish. And it's a pretty pessimistic book compared mm. to his earlier vision that it was possible to achieve liberty through this constitutional contract. There, um, let's, let's, okay, you're back on David Hume's boat. And you've been told you can jump off and swim to land that you can't see as you can you can leave the system. But there's also another way, I, I guess, um, just call it exitable or leaveable is probably not the right word. But there's another way you can exit the system, and that's to reform the system from inside, which is in which in a way is to leave the system and create a brand new one. So would that be enough? Because that is a very high barrier, even in today's world, if you get told, you know, you can just leave your country. Well, good luck getting another citizenship. It's not that easy. You're gonna have to try and find ways and means and start a new life somewhere. It's a huge barrier. But if the, the right mechanisms are in place to reform the current system you're in, is that enough? It's certainly a help. Um, 
One difficulty of making reform of the system easy is that it will encourage another pathology that Buchanan and Tulloch identified, which is called rent seeking. So rent seeking is the creation of artificial benefits for private groups that are awarded by government to the group that does the best job of providing bribes or benefits to government officials. So attempts at reform would work, except that it is unlikely that the concentrations of power are going to want to change in the direction of limiting power. They're probably going to want to change in the direction of concentrating power. And you, when we first started talking, made this argument, I thought very well, uh, the, the Brian Kaplan sort of argument that said voters are actually rationally irrational. If I buy a car and it's a bad car, then I have a bad car. If I just vote my conscience, or worse, if I just vote my uh, ideas about utopia and it doesn't turn out, well, at least I got to vote for the, the group that I wanted. Yes, the society isn't very good, but I didn't cause that because my vote didn't determine the outcome. So in large groups, the idea that reform is going to be possible relies on the, I think, probably optimistic, mistaken notion that voters are going to be well-informed enough to know what a positive direction of reform would be, rather than being taken in by utopian crackpots who just want to impose their particular system, which that reform is going to be catastrophic. So why are pressure groups so so much so so much of a problem? You've done a lot of work on this, and the, I, I believe the the system in politics is called log rolling, and um, it, it's so we all have ideas like this, this. There's a freeway connecting two towns, and everyone agrees it's in their best interest, and then but then special interests start getting involved. Like the union says, it has to be done by union labor. The environmentalists don't want it built in this area. The people who worry about air control and air pollution don't want it being built near their houses. And it seems to be the case that the intensity of small personal interest overweighs the collective interest and the then the, the freeway never gets built. So not long after Buchanan and Tulloch wrote in 1962, The Calculus of Consent, another economist named Mansur Olson wrote a famous public choice book in 1965 called The Logic of Collective Action. And he pointed out what should be obvious. It's just a forehead smacking moment. As soon as he says it, you say, oh, of course, what he said was that what matters for groups to form as effective organization has nothing to do with the size of the benefit to the group. Nothing. All that matters is the benefit to the individuals. So I have a video, and maybe you can put a link up to it, uh, called uh, why is the NRA so powerful? Why is the National Rifle Association so powerful? Mm. Most Americans would like to see more gun control. But if anything, the U.S. is moving in the direction of less gun control. Well, the question is, why is this concentrated uh, interest so powerful? And the answer is, if you're a gun manufacturer, you make your entire living from making AR-15s and other kinds of guns. And I'm not talking about the merits here. I'm just talking about the economic forces. If you own a gun, you care a lot about uh, gun rights and being able to go to firing ranges, being able to buy, buy ammunition. And then there are millions of Americans who think, you know, I actually think that it would be better if we had more gun control. But they all value this slightly. Whereas the tens of thousands of people who value guns value it a lot. So the concentrated benefits to those individuals mean that many people are willing to work, to lobby, to make contributions, whereas none of the people who are want more gun control 
really want to participate in the political process. So the, if we're to just for the sake of example, let's put some numbers on this. Suppose I would pay 50 cents to have more gun control. And there's a million people that would do that. Well, that seems like it would be a million dollars times 50, a million people times 50 cents, except that it cost me a dollar to contact each of them. There's no way to organize those people. On the other hand, there's 100,000 people who would each pay $100 to be able to expand gun rights. Well, I can contact those people. I can get them organized. So it's 100,000 in favor of more gun rights against zero who want to gun control. Even though there's a million people who would vote for it if they had a chance, they never get the chance because it's never organized. So what Mansur Olson showed was that groups in politics. And this actually, the, the I think this uh, put paid to any idea of sort of Marxist class-based politics. And that's actually what he was writing about, was the impossibility of organizing large groups around small economic benefits, having class consciousness. So the, the, the problem with groups in politics is that there's no necessary relation between the strength of the organized group and the size of the benefit to the group. What matters is the benefits to the individuals. And so as a result, if you rely on groups, you're going to get dominance by existing power and reform, those groups are as powerful as they want to be. You try to put in reform, they immediately have pop up lobbyists, they're able to raise as much money as they need. Reform is an equilibrium that almost can never be broken. So in economic terms, then the, the votes we have have an economic value of a kind, or they wouldn't be purchasable in this way. Um, so it's, it's, it's a hard Earlier on in our discussion, very early on, you said um, we should get rid of this idea of the general will. And as you were talking there, it was what was hitting through my brain was: does that imply we have to get rid of the idea of um, the of the public interest as a real thing out there? Does it exist as a as a as a real, uh, tangible, useful phenomena? Right, right. It, it, mm. In a hundred words or less. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it, it, it is, let me put it in philosophical terms. The idea of the general will seems like it is just a problem of epistemology. We all know there must be a right thing to do. And what we need to do is to discover it. And so epistemology means that how do we know? So what we're going to do is we'll use different voting mechanisms to decide what is the best thing to do. That was Rousseau's proposal. But it turns out there's an ontological problem. The ontological problem is the existence of the general will in the first place. So another big part of the public choice movement were some advances in social choice in the 1950s and 1960s. Kenneth Arrow, in 1951, published a book about what he called the impossibility theorem. And uh, Duncan Black and Anthony Downs published books in 1957 and 1958 about the way that majority rule works. And what they showed, and this is disturbing, it's hard to explain, um, so I, I'll just say it quickly. Mm -hmm. What they showed was that if you have at least three choices three choosers, and disagreement, then majority rule can be radically incoherent. And it's like rock, paper, scissors. So the game rock, paper, scissors, rock beats scissors, beats paper, beats rock. These are called majority rule cycles, which means that you could have one candidate who would defeat another candidate by majority rule, who would defeat another candidate by majority rule, who would defeat the first candidate by majority rule. So the question is, what's the general will? And you might say, well, it's what the majority wants. But there's three different majorities, and each of those things, you can't have all three. It's actually incoherent. So we, th this is called the intransitivity process, the in in property. So we tend to think in terms of numbers. Seven is bigger than five. Five is bigger than three. It must be that seven is bigger than three. But it doesn't work that way in politics. 
And there's actually examples that have been demonstrated where it literally true that the general will does not exist. And that means that, and this is my definition of public choice, Mm -hmm. public choice and James Buchanan showed that rules matter more than they should. The underlying preferences of voters are actually incoherent. But if I get to choose the rules, I can get any outcome that I want. I am the maker of rules dealing with fools, and I can cheat you blind. (laughs) I hope you're enjoying the podcast so far, and I apologize for this brief interruption. But I will take this moment to briefly send out a plug for the podcast itself. The Popperian podcast is something that I've been planning for quite a while, and it's something that I want to keep running month to month. But to do so, it's going to need your help. If you're willing or able or interested, please go to the links below the podcast and support us however you can. It will be your help as listeners that keeps the podcast going and keeps the content coming out. And I thank you in advance. And with that said, we will now return to the second half of the interview. Thanks for listening. So in some ways, the general will is is just the rules we consent to and our failure to properly consent or probably understand what we're consenting to in some way. So as you say that again, there's a I can read all the rules for a social club before I enter it. And I, and I then get inside the social club. And when I get in there and this is the case with every government, every world, every little it even a, a one-on-one relationship with someone. As soon as you get inside it, you realize there's a whole range of tacit, unwritten cultural rules that are there that perhaps you didn't know about before you got inside. So how do we deal with the idea of unspoken rules and unspoken laws and unspoken norms? That's one of the biggest research agendas in the sort of second and third waves of public choice. So it, it happens that I worked myself quite a bit with two Nobel Prize winners, um, Douglas North, who won the Nobel Prize in 1993, and Eleanor Ostrom, who won the Nobel Prize, I think, in 2001. The two of them both worked on the problem of institutions as implicit norms. And the the th- that's that question by itself is three more podcasts. But again, <laughs> I will give an answer that by its nature, because it's an abbreviation, is completely inadequate and probably just make your listeners angry. But Adam Smith, in The Theory of Moral Sentiments, the, the book that he published in 1759, he didn't publish The Wealth of Nations till 1776. Adam Smith in The Theory of Moral Sentiments looked at an emergent property of societies that he called the system of propriety. We have a sense of emotional reactions that are based on our moral sentiments when we see someone act in a certain way. And he thought societies evolved towards having better systems of propriety, which meant that I approve of things that are good for the public interest and I disapprove of things that are bad for the public interest. And that means that we have this decentralized system where if someone cheats or acts badly, they get disapproval from their neighbors. And if someone acts well and they help an old lady across the street, they make charitable contributions, they get approval from our neighbors. And Adam Smith said it was important that not just that we wanted to be loved, but we wanted to be lovely. We wanted to be deserving of the respect and admiration of other people. And that desire to get approval, given that approval, it only comes when we do things that are in the the public interest. Over time, propriety evolves to become better. So the system of morals, the cultural system of norms, And Douglas North and Friedrich Hayek and Eleanor Ostrom all wrote a great deal about this evolutionary process that leads us to have moral systems in some societies that succeed that give approval to things that are in the public interest. So it's not so much that there is no public interest. There is. If we all keep our word, we keep our promises, we help each other, that's the public interest. What's not clear is that we can use voting to discover the public interest. We can use propriety in this evolved system, this emergent system 
of moral approval because what's embodied in that is the accumulated wisdom of hundreds of years where we approve of things that are good for society, we disapprove of things that are bad. So on that one, that 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 last thing you said there was a. It seemed like a. I read that in. I was rereading the book earlier this week as I was preparing, and I reread that part, and that part stuck out. I think he, they called it the relatively absolute absolutes or something like this. This idea of old laws and norms being passed down. And at the start, you said he was a libertarian socialist, but as I read that part, it sounded like he was a conservative. The idea that because someone has has existed and is important and is in place that it somehow has a value, and that value should be respected. William F. Buckley said that conservatism was standing athwart history, shouting stop. (laughs) That was his definition of conservatism, that things are actually getting worse, and we need to preserve the traditions that have been handed down to us from the past. The relatively absolute absolute is a middle position, and it is something that Um, Frank Knight had come up with, or at least had passed on to James Buchanan, and you're right to bring it up because the relatively absolute absolutes is the central part of James Buchanan's political philosophy. The relatively absolute absolutes would say that there there are, there's wisdom that has been handed down to us from the traditions of the past. And these traditions have stood the test of time because we know that the societies that are organized according to these principles, private property, trust, charity, benevolence, those societies prospered a lot more than societies that tried to cheat each other, that are constantly selfish. And so we just see the comparative evolutionary growth and prosperity of countries that do this. However, it's only a relatively absolute absolute. James Buchanan, like Friedrich Hayek, was moved to write an article, Why I Am Not a Conservative. Hayek Mm. had an article, Why I'm Not a Conservative. Buchanan wrote an article, Why I Too Am Not a Conservative. Because he also thought that every one of these questions about traditions of the past, they should be constantly questioned and reevaluated. So I would say it's something like playing a game. During the time that we're playing a game, we accept the rules because we're part of the game. But then we would ask ourselves, after that game is finished, do I want to play that game again or do I want to play a different one? And this is your reform question. We actually have to try to be open to reform because things like slavery, patriarchy, the the repressive traditions that have come down to us from the past, those are no good. So the question is, how can we tell the difference? The relatively absolute absolutes would say, we accept the traditions of the past, but we constantly question them. But we don't get rid of them until we believe that we have found some principle for saying, you know, this is wrong. And that sounds frustrating because it means that, well, what really is the guideline here? But notice that's a middle ground between conservatives who say all traditions from the past are good, just shout stop, and the project of reason in the French Revolution that said, we'll just start over. In the French Revolution, 1789, they started the calendar at zero. Mm -hmm. They renamed all the months. They decided that history starts with us, and we can just make up all the traditions and institutions. That's wrong, too. You have to accept the traditions and useful, the wisdom that is embodied in Because we don't understand. We actually don't understand the mapping from institutions into outcomes. There's a lot of things that work, and we don't really understand why. And if we try to change them, we'll be worse off. But on the other hand, we should still question them. So this is one of the most frustrating parts, and you're right to put your finger on it. It's one of the most frustrating parts of Buchanan's philosophy, because the relatively absolute absolutes means that he's constantly escaping from any question, either because he says, well, that's a tradition, we have to keep doing it. And then you say, yeah, but what about this tradition? It's stupid. Oh, yeah, we shouldn't do that. How do you tell? Hmm. Uh, 
On the idea of choosing a, a, the rules in which we govern this uh, constitution and it needing to be unanimous, as you're speaking there, again, I, 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 a, th a thousand thoughts rattling through my brain here. This idea that we can, um, that we need to consent to the rules and then be, and then agree to be coerced after that by that consent. Well, what if you have a holdout? What if there's 99 of us, 99% of the country, and one person holding out? And I, th I think the easiest way to think about this is perhaps international law. Every country in the world adopts a convention against genocide, and let's pretend one doesn't. Is it, um, at the start you said, there's a moral implication to this too, but is it moral to then allow that one country not to sign up? To the genocide convention so they may never sign up but should we let's sit back and say they're allowed to commit genocide because they didn't sign up the more the morality seems to cut both ways here one they didn't consent and therefore it feels wrong to coerce them but in another way they're doing something which 99 percent of the, of the world thinks is immoral and deeply immoral buchanan's response to that would have two parts First, he admits that while unanimity is the goal as a practical matter, probably everyone would agree to have a decision rule that is not un unanimous, because if we don't make some kind of choice, we're going to be in the Hobbesian state of nature. Mm. And so we're probably going to say, we'll never, we're gonna, we'll be here forever arguing if we require unanimous rule. So he called it qualified unanimity. And you read the book you saw in chapter five, where they have these different optimal majorities, where they have graphs about the yeah. costs of exclusion and inclusion. And famously, and I, I wish Buchanan and Tulloch had cited this, Rousseau took up this question directly. And he asked, what is the size of the group that should be able to make decisions? And he said that in the case of decisions about the social contract itself, unanimity, the consent of all is required. For decisions that have to be made quickly, something like majority should be required because that's the smallest group that require, that, that prevents the simultaneous passage of two conflicting resolutions. So if you have 50% plus one, you cannot simultaneously pass two conflicting resolutions. So the if, if we have to make a decision in a hurry, majority rule is good. If we have to make an important decision that's going to affect everyone, we can be more reflective and require unanimity. So how does Rousseau get around this question? Well, his answer is, suppose that we come together and we form a social contract, but there's some holdouts. Well, they will be aliens living among citizens. They will not have the rights, but they will also not have the obligations of citizens. And he thinks that they should exit or go somewhere else. If they continue to live in that country, then in fact, they are consenting. But Rousseau has this great footnote that most people who quote him don't recognize. And he doesn't, I think he uses three or four footnotes in all of du contrat social. But in this footnote, he says, this assumes, of course, that all the attributes of liberty are present in the decision. If it is too expensive for people to leave, then this wouldn't be true. But then what is true? That's no answer mm -hmm. at all, precisely mm -hmm. because what if it's too expensive to leave? So Buchanan wants there to be a qualified majority, maybe 75%, 80%, enough so that if there's just a few holdouts, we still make a decision, it's binding on everyone, which brings me to the second part, there has to be some way of not participating in the consensus if I don't want to. And then the, the, the question would be, we need to have decentralized systems of organization then so that there are many different kinds of organizations that would engage in a sorting that was first suggested by Charles Thibault, T-I-E-B-O-U-T. -E so Thibault short uh, sorting meant that if you have many different cities, you might have many different levels of taxes and public finance and different kinds of parks. And then people could move to the municipality that most closely approximated their own preferences. Moving's expensive, but still that's the best system because it, it, we're all better off if we're able to provide some kind of public goods and finance them. And 
Thibault called that kind of sorting voting with the feet. So instead of voting, we move to the place that most closely approximates the mix of expenditures and taxes that we favor. It won't be perfect, but it will be better. So the two things that matter is first, Buchanan favored qualified majority, not full unanimity, just because of the practical concerns you raise. Second, we need to build into the rules whenever it's possible, the possibility of exit or sorting among different political geographic units so that people are able to approximate what they might have achieved by voting, but now they can just use voting with the feet. On that as well, what if the person doesn't want to leave? What, what if they are um, slightly less moral kind of character? And you mentioned, you said earlier that you were a redneck, I think you said, and you said Buchanan was too. And I know you've mentioned this analogy that Buchanan has used about mosquitoes in your neighbor's yard. And I've lived in places where mosquitoes are a big problem. And every year they really a big uh, crackdown on trying to get rid of pools of water, basically, where they breed and cause problems. And it's not a, it, it, it doesn't help anyone. If you do it, your neighbor does it, your neighbor does it. And then the third or fourth neighbor doesn't do it. Everyone suffers from the same plague here. It seems to open and offering an exit to people that may not be interested in the exit and may not be interested in, in um, I was about to say public good, but we've been over that, but any idea that um, they are a shared member of um, some- But it, it, you're, it, it is the public good in the sense that I actually carry out the implied promise that I do my part because we'll all be better if all, all we'll be better off if we all participate. So it's a prisoner's dilemma in the sense that, and the, the mosquito example is a good one. I have, let's suppose I have three or four old tires and some cans and pools of water. It rains pretty often. And I actually have to be pretty careful to go around and make sure that the tires are not full of water because those are just perfect breeding grounds for mosquitoes. But the fact is it doesn't matter that much whether I do that or not, if, if all of my neighbors are assiduous in removing those pools of water, then if I don't do it, it doesn't affect the outcome very much. Or if none of my neighbors do it, it doesn't affect the outcome very much. So my individual contribution doesn't matter very much. But then you have a free rider problem, don't you? All point? of us will free ride. Mm. And since all of us will free ride, it will look like gosh, these people are stupid. Well, they're not. They're just individually rational, but they haven't solved the problem of getting the incentives right. Buchanan would say that some of the answer to this in rural communities is we all know each other. And if I see that you've the bunch of rain pools, I will come over and say, look, come on, we're all in this together. And something like propriety or manners may help solve the problem. On the other hand, we might have a someone who drives around our city in a truck, and if they see pools of water on your property, they will give you a ticket and fine you $15. And you say, well, I didn't consent to this. And yes, actually you did, because it was a part of the decision that the municipality reached. The city council voted on this, and by buying a piece of property within the city, you consent to be bound by the decisions of the city council. So you, 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 when you bought property within this, within the city limits, you consented to be bound by the rules of the city council. That's not a very good argument, actually. Cities sometimes grow. And in fact, I live outside of the city of Raleigh, North Carolina, which is uh, the, the capital of the state of North Carolina. Our uh, property may be annexed by the city, made part of the city, and the way they'll decide whether to annex it is to have a vote. Well, the ci citizens of Raleigh <laughs> are going to say, yes, let's annex this. I'm going to vote no, and it's going to be 800,000 to one. So that's not really consent. It's true that I can sell my house and leave, but it, 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 it's not really consent. I'm not going to say that that's an adequate answer. But the, the thing that's interesting is that often we can rely on something like manners. If it's really true that all of my neighbors are pretty careful about picking up all of the old tires and cans and pools of water, I'm more likely to just out of a sense of collective purpose. 
So you you asked before about the nation. Mm. None of this works at the national level because there's no world constitution. And then so, in fact, the, the, the Hobbesian problem of an anarchic international system is not one that we can solve very well. And it would require, paradoxically, well, suppose Rwanda is engaging in a genocide. Mm-hmm. Is the United States justified in sending in troops to kill Rwandans to prevent them from killing Rwandans? That seems paradoxical. Because that country did not consent. Now, it might be that the United Nations would say we're going to send in troops, but the United Nations is terribly unable to act because many countries are worried, yeah, today Rwanda, maybe China, maybe you'll send it to some other autocratic nation. I don't want to have this precedent. And so that we vote no. The United Nations should be the mechanism by which we solve this problem. If someone does not consent to what we have agreed to be the the rules of humanity, the way that we treat each other, there's no enforcement mechanism. So let's talk about um, America, of course, and the American Constitution, the one everyone seems to talk about, of course. Um, it's it, Again, it was, it, it was arrived at, at upon unanimous consent, and then the rules that of the game, the rules that we have today, and we can exit and or at it if we like, and try to reform it at a certain high barrier if we like. Um, <clears throat> and people still seem to have this idea that it is the thing that makes America great, that it was written by great men. And Buchanan and Talek's work, uh, it seems to be the opposite of this, that this is this is wrong, that it is not such a great document. It's just the beginning. It's the starting point, some sort of shared vocabulary in which we can move forward from there and begin to change things. And, um, and perhaps this begins to explain why the document itself is such a uh, a, a hotbed of controversy, despite the, all those uh, grand ideas that people tend to have about it. Well, the United States has made the Constitution. We've attached a set of sec- myths to it. We have secular saints that the pictures of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, they stare down at our school children from the walls, you know, beatifically as if they were gods or uh, figures from the unimaginable past. And in fact, they were just men uh, who were trying to figure out a hard problem of governance. The, In fact, James Buchanan uh, James Madison had opposed the very idea of the Bill of Bill of Rights. With many people, when they say the U.S. Constitution, what they actually mean is the Bill of Rights, the yeah. set of rights that are guaranteed for individuals against incursion by the government. And that actually is probably the thing that is unique about the American Constitution is those limitations on what the government can do. So the, the, the expression of the general will in the American mind is the constitution. It is not legislation. So if you compare the first amendment to the US constitution, it says Congress will make no law restricting and then it gives five freedoms. If you, if you look at the French Declaration of the Rights of Man, which was, was actually passed in July of 1789. So these two documents were actually both written in um, July and August of 1789. Now, they weren't in communication, so they didn't know. But holding those two things up side by side is interesting. French Declaration of the Rights of Man says that no one shall be disquieted on account of his political opinions unless it violates the law. Well, wait, (laughs) pass a law saying your political position is illegal, that's no protection at all. So the American system protects political views against the government. The French system says that the will of the people is the legislature because it is a Rousseauvian country, unsurprisingly. And so that's the big difference. It ultimately comes down to whether you think the legislature is composed of fallible human beings and the Constitution constrains them from doing bad things, or you think the legislature is composed of a bunch of angelic geniuses and their emissions are all glowing with angels singing in the background, and that is the will of the people. So the American system is different in the sense that we don't trust our legislators. We trust instead our constitution to protect us from the bad actions of legislatures. 
there is um, a quote within the book, which I don't have in front of me right now, but it is something along the lines of, um, uh, this, and this is, I think it's Tulloch writing this, but of course it's written together. And it, it, he says, um, state should never be given enough power to prevent popular uprisings against it. And he's talking about this fear of a Hobbesian Leviathan taking over and things like this. Um, and, and so what place within the system is 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 weakness? So a constitution sounds very much like this overarching strong document where we all consent and we consent to the punishment itself. But within it is itself a, a, a an inbuilt fragility of a kind within the, the structures of government within the structures of the Constitution. Famously, Thomas Jefferson, I think in the 1790s, late 1790s, wrote a letter in which he said that the tree of liberty must be refreshed every 20 mm. years or so by the blood of patriots and tyrants. It is its natural manure. So he actually wanted actual consent every 20 years or so. And his idea of reform was that there would be an armed revolution. Well, he became president, of course, uh, in 1800. And that he changed his mind quite a bit. Once he became president, he was no longer as big a fan of armed revolutions. But I, I, the, the more serious answer is that we face a difficulty in having a system powerful enough to be able to enforce the legitimate will of majorities against dissent and to protect Americans in the U.S. from foreign attack. Now, our military is much bigger than that. Uh, in fact, our, our, our military spending is bigger than the next five uh, countries combined. So the, we're doing something more than just providing defense for the United States. And you, when you add police, uh, we spend an awful lot on, and I'm making air quotes, on defense. Now, mm -hmm. that means that we're also subject to coercion that we might be concerned about. Why is it? When you think about it, it's remarkable. You have an election, and the person who won hates the person who, forgive me, the person who lost, the incumbent, let's say, uh, and this happened in 1800. So John Adams loses, and he's very worried uh, about Thomas Jefferson. But he voluntarily leaves. There was a revolution, a peaceful velvet revolution, where you hand over the keys to power. There's no reason to take that for granted. Americans do. And in the 2000 election, we actually saw, for the first time in my lifetime, something close to the loser not accepting the fact that, well, I have to give up power. Suppose that Donald Trump had actually led the march on the Capitol. Suppose that there had been some elements of the military that had been sympathetic to Donald Trump and tanks had surrounded the, the Capitol building. It, 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 it happens in other countries. Americans think we're immune. That's wrong. It could happen. So right now we're witnessing in real time something that a, 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 a historic constitutional experiment in uh, the country of Chile in South America. They tried for the last two years to come up with a new constitution to balance this notion. And of course, Chile had a military dictatorship between 1973 and 1990. So there's actual experience of them of having a military coup and having an autocratic, repressive military government. So it's not hypothetical for them. They're trying to write a new constitution. They spent months and months on writing a new constitution, and it was turned down by a, a plebiscite, 62% to 38%. So we're, you know, you and I have been talking about sort of hypothetical theoretical problems keep an eye on what Chile is doing, because right now they're, they're taking a second pass at trying to write a new constitution. And one of the main things they're trying to solve is the problem that you raise. How do you balance having a government powerful enough to do what you want without having a government so powerful that it takes everything that you have? Is one of the problems here, I, am, I probably should have mentioned this earlier, but running through all this seems to be John Rawls' veil of ignorance here, the idea that you, you don't know where you're going to sit within the system itself. And I'm assuming this has to be part of the calculus of consent. Of You consent to a political system, but it, it's not 
if you consent to a political system, no one you're going to be at the top of it. You're going to be, you're going to consent to something very different and hope for something very different than if you imagine you can be at the bottom or if you don't know where you are. So how it must be vitally important in this consent that you don't that you're blind to your own existence within it. You have raised a pet peeve of mine. <laughs> John Rawls first published about the veil of ignorance in 1958. He attended public choice meetings in the 60s. There's a famous letter from John Rawls to James Buchanan saying, you know, I, after having read the calculus of consent, uh, you really have changed my thinking about the veil of ignorance. Because Buchanan and Tulloch are very clear that it is important that the constitutional rules be relatively vague, they operate at a high level, and so people are not able to intuit what the likely implications of different rules are for their own welfare. They're not sure what their position will be in the world of realized institutions on the other side of the constitutional convention. They thought that was an essential part of having good rules. And Rawls acknowledged that that really affected his thinking. Damn it, in the 1971 book, The Theory of Justice, Rawls does not cite the calculus of consent, even though he had acknowledged in a personal letter that it had affected his thinking. So Rawls partly achieved originality simply by ignoring the other work that had already been done on this question. Now, what you've said is right. That's an important part of Buchanan and Tulloch's uh, formulation. And it is interesting in the case of Chile, I think people actually have some understanding of how the rules are likely to affect. They study the provisions of the Constitution. It may be hard to achieve that kind of veil of ignorance. But I, I think we all agree the rules are more likely to be fair if they are at a level of abstraction high enough that it's hard for me to know what the actual outcomes are going to be. And so I vote based on my sense of fairness, not on my self-interest. That, that's an essential part of making sure that the rules are fair. That's true. Now, talking about Chile as the last couple of questions here, um, I've never really been part of a constitutional process apart from a few votes on a few const constitutional referendums. Um, but it, it seems that now, of course, for Chile, they're starting afresh, but just as a practical concern, um, the idea of constantly debating uh, the rules of the game, it seems intolerable, simply as a practical matter, something that you, you can't run. Imagine playing you know, a basketball game and uh, constantly having to stop and debate the rules of the game itself. And I wonder how, how massively important the actual constitution is or, or rather that at some point you you get simply tired of of debating the rules of the game and you simply stop and say we're just going to have to consent to some mild language which is not really what we want but you just get exhausted by the process about process and the rules about rules and you've just got to get on with your life well that's the hopeful part what happened this first time was there's there, there were almost 500 different provisions because it was like a Christmas tree uh, in, in Chile. So what had happened was they had elected a convention of 155 people and the right had not taken it very seriously. So they hadn't really campaigned. And so because they thought they would have at least one third, it takes a two, it takes a one third plus one to veto a provision to go into the proposed constitution. And the, the Chilean right only got 25%. And they everybody thought that was a disaster because now the left is going to be able to propose whatever constitution they want. Well, the left argued about all of these rules and they had a bunch of vague provisions. Nobody knew what they meant. And it was clear that they were going to be arguing about the meaning of these 500 provisions for years. So the right actually got lucky. If they had been part of the Constitutional Convention, they would have vetoed many of these. Since they couldn't veto them, the left just had all this accretion of the, a Christmas list, all their different wish lists. Let's do this. Let's do this. So they, they made up a bunch of rights. They had a, a, a very complicated system for indigenous people to have an autonomous government. So the, the Mapuche are an, uh, an indigenous people in the south of Chile. 
And there were a few radicals who wanted to have an autonomous Mapuche nation, but it wasn't clear how it was going to work. Is it going to be sovereign? Or is it really going to be a separate country? So that's the reason that we're going to argue about this forever. The Mapuche themselves voted against the new constitution because they, they weren't sure enough about how it was going to work. So the, the right, by not having a veto, accidentally allowed the left to do, basically, I have heard people give exactly the argument that you made. We're going to be arguing about this forever. Let's vote no. But you did mention somewhere, um, it's one of the problems that seems to be with constitutions, as, as you said, that we argue about this and these provisions, these 500 provisions forever. And that seems so we can we could we consent with unanimous uh, rule to these rules of the game and you have them there. But if you look at the American system, for, for example, the whole game afterwards was not so much that these are the rules and we accept them, but so much of the fight. Uh, today is not even reform the rules, but simply reinterpret the rules. Try imagine what they really meant, what they said, what the framers really had in their mind from the very beginning. And it seems like reinterpretation or interpretation. Of course, no language is is completely clear. No, you can't speak in completely clear ways for that matter. Um, it it seems that you this is a backdoor into constitutional change and a way around that consent. Well, that is the way that reform works. Um, rather than having votes on reform, we have political pressure and the Supreme Court respond in the United States responds to that political pressure by reinterpreting it in ways that are actually consistent with something like what a strong majority would want. And so I think that's an avenue for reform of a constitution. It is not the way that Buchanan and Tulloch describe it. But it, it is the way that at least the U.S. constitutional system has worked. It's an escape valve. Rather than having these things that are written out in stone, and that's the interpretation forever, yes, they're constantly reinterpreted at the margin. There's a problem if it is reinterpreted. And, and again, I want to credit, if we're always arguing about the rules, if, they, if it doesn't mean what the plain meaning of the words say, but it means what a group of nine judges in black robes say it says, then we're spending too much time trying to argue cases before the Supreme Court because no one knows what the Constitution means. So the, the U.S. Supreme Court in recent years has made a bunch of radical changes that I think has reduced their legitimacy. And I think they're recognizing that. So uh, the, the, I would expect the U.S. Supreme Court to pull back a bit, because if we're constantly arguing about the meaning of all of these parts of the Constitution, none of them mean anything. Mm -hmm. And the, the value of having this document that we, because mostly what we want to know is, what is the what are the rules uh, what's going to happen if I do this or if I don't do that? And to be able to know that, then the rules have to be relatively easy to understand and relatively consistent over time. And just the, in, it just in your mind, the Supreme Court will likely do this because they fear the the um, the uh, some sort of punishment from Congress or from Senate or from the population, or will they do it out of a, 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 a just a uh, a self-interest, for example, that they yeah. too don't want to be doing this? Well, it, it, it is a combination of their concern for the nation because they recognize that if we're always arguing uh, about what the rules are, that's no good. Even if they think, you know, I, I know what the rules should be, they're also concerned uh, about always arguing about the rules. But they recognize that part of their sense of being important, interesting people. You know, they're, they're members of the Supreme Court. If the Supreme Court loses its legitimacy and authority, it actually hurts their own self-interest. So uh, James Buchanan famously in Federalist 51 said that ambition must be made to counteract ambition and that he thought that the Supreme Court would protect its legitimacy by being worried about its authority and not paradoxically, the only reason the Supreme Court has authority is if it doesn't overuse it. And so the Supreme Court's own self-interest, their own ambition is going to lead them to be less aggressive about making changes, even if some members of the court would favor those changes. Now, I've kept you much longer than I said I would. So last question, I promise. Um, 
uh, and this is where we slightly again a large question in a way but um you know this book it, its ramifications outside of philosophy are much larger it seems to have a huge impact in the fields of economics and political science so i might ask you just what that um uh, what the legacy of buchanan and tulloch and the capitalist of consent is because it, it seems to have um bred new fields in economic theory and political theory and explain some things in the world that um previously poorly explained, such as why some institutions succeed and why some fail? It's an interesting question. Um, the calculus of consent is now rarely read in an economics graduate program, and it's not read in most political science graduate programs. But the reason is that it had such a big impact that it is now sort of piecemeal implemented into both economics and political science. So you may not always see it referenced by name, but if you look at the way that we talk about constitutions, if you look at the way that we talk about choosing rules, much of the calculus of consent is simply, when, at the time it was published, it was controversial and unorthodox. Now it's become part of the standard toolkit. So I think the, the if Buchanan were alive today, it might have sort of a a wry sense that even though the work isn't cited by name very much, it has changed the way that we think about the problem. And, you know, in the long run, it's much more, it's much better to have an impact on the way that people think rather than just to be cited, but not read. That is um, a wonderful note to end the podcast on as well. Um, below the podcast, I'm going to link um, the the link that, that Michael mentioned earlier about the NRA. I'm going to link the Calculus of Consent, but I'm going to link also Michael's uh, biography and his website and places where you can go and find his books and other talks. Michael Munger, it has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks so much, and thanks for getting in touch.